Brace. Liz. Can I say something without being, without sounding anti-Semitic? That would be a first. I actually would ask you the same That's question. So mean. Can you say something without being anti-Semitic? Be for, hey, be real. Okay. Be for real. I'll be for real, and I'll tell you. I'll be for real, and I'll, I'll answer you completely honestly. Okay. Remember, you're my friend, confidant, creative partner. Uh huh. Many things that I can't say to the audience. Yeah, because that would be um, some things that I could probably say, certain words that you couldn't because they would have a different context coming from there. Is what you mean? Do you remember when I told you about seeing mole people? <sighs> yeah, I do. You said you saw a mole person in the J Church uh, going down into, I guess it would be Van- towards Van S Station on the J. Okay, so just want to put that aside for a second. What's up with the Hasidic tunnels? It's interesting you would ask me that. Um, in First of all, because while I'm Jewish, I'm not Hasidic. Well, I'm no longer Hasidic. Uh, and second, it's, it's interesting that you would ask me that immediately asking me about mole people. Because I, I, I understand the connection I'm, you're trying to make here is that you think that Jews are possibly a – at least Hasidic Jews – are possibly a malformed race of underground mutants, kind of like the is it Morlocks? Yes. Is it it's more like kind of like the Morlocks? So you're asking me is if Morlocks are real and they are both practitioners of well a specific brand of Judaism, uh, and if they also might be crossbred with moles, possibly to start a new race of humans that could better weather nuclear apocalypse. You know, I'm constantly setting you up for jokes. I'm giving you so much. I give you so much. And what do you do? You tear me down. I don't tear you down. You're right, 100%. This is something that we've been keeping from you guys for a long time. We've been fucking mole women. My thing with the tunnels is like, well, I've got a lot of things with the tunnels, real quick. You do. Where were they going? So as far as I can understand, I spent a long time last night talking to people who would have a better view of mm. of the situation than I would. People Mole people. Yeah, no, no. Underground. No, no, just other Jewish um, people, but people who have been have more uh, uh, interactions with the site. Hole diggers. Question. Hole diggers, yeah. Uh, I No one really has a straight answer over all of the questions that are raised by the videos mm-hmm. of the uh, tunnels underneath the uh, – I, I mean, I guess it's a synagogue, but it's also just like a, a center yeah. in Crown Heights. Um, from what I can understand from a video that I saw that wasn't part of that thread of videos that was on Twitter, uh, that – they were digging from just like one part of the building to the other. And that's what they say. Well, I don't really understand how they would dig anywhere else, but there do seem to be exits that go outside of the building as well. Yeah. But the thing that I don't understand is that. Well, the, there, and there were beer cans down there. They're partying. They were definitely partying down there. But a lot of people don't know this, but Hasidic Jews party in crazy ways. Like they like will. Like, get wasted, but, like, in secret. Like, they don't do it, like, it's, it's, uh, like, they'll do it, like, in the dark or, like, yeah, in, like, yeah, a, yeah. Like a in tunnels. closet or in the tunnels and stuff like that. Mm. Like, people were bringing, like, they were bringing those mattresses out of the, <laughs> out of the tunnels and people were, like, they're, they're, like, you know, having sex or they're raping down there. It's, like, I'm almost positive that that's probably wine stains or, like, poo. Uh, cause, like, those guys get fucked up. And so from what I can understand is that there's like a group of – there's all these like Chabad guys. Some of them think Mas- the, Mas- the Messiah came already. Mm. Some of them think he was just a rabbi. And then there's like a, a, a group of them who are like he is legit the Messiah. Uh and like he's gonna come back, like all Jews will be raised from the dead, blah blah blah. Uh, and I crazy. think these are part of maybe those groups of like you see those Messiah here posters ag- around. No, 
You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. They're like all over like the back of like light poles and stuff. They're like saying Mashiach is here and have them. Uh, and there's a group of guys from Israel that is apparently this group of of, of fellows who are tunneling. In yeah, they the did walls. say that they were looking at revoking their visas. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're from Israel, um, which is really funny. <laughs> but it's tough out there, man. It's tough out there. It's, it's tough been out there. rough for the brand for a bit now. We've been having Jews. We've been having a. T- uh, I'm not going to say we've had the greatest year. Well, it's uh, a new year of our history, but we've had a lot of bad years, I guess. Uh, it's a new year. Yeah. Well. Not There's really only eight fast, days but, in uh, It's it's yeah it's it's been tough. The tunnels don't make it easier, but right. the tunnels are I would say to me a source of joy mm. and happiness, and I'm glad the tunnels are real. Yeah, and I hope that there's more tunnels. It's always easy to just say we're trying to go to China. Everyone understands that one to get the Kaifeng Jews to get those Chinese. You know, there's like a thousand Chinese Jews, which is cr- respect, but kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about, cause I've been in the, t- like I go to the tunnels and mm, stuff mm, like, like me mm. and Chomsky sometimes go there on like Sundays and stuff. There's, they do pick a ball underneath there. And of course, as you know, I'm one of New York's top pickleball players. Remember those diagrams of the Hamas tunnels? Yeah. They should have added pickleball course in there. That would have been so <laughs> fucking funny. Yes. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, I'm almost positive. Like they, it's either part of these guys were trying to like create their own space within the building of, for, like, their special sect mm, of mm-hmm. uh, insane people, or they were having gay sex and drinking down there, yeah. which is, like, a huge possibility, too, because, like, those guys... I mean, I'm not saying these guys in particular, but, like, guys in that milieu be doing some crazy shit. My friend once picked up a, uh, a seated guy who was on acid on the side of the BQE. Mm. Uh, another girl I know... pick him up? I was just standing there. I don't know. Why didn't she pick it? I mean, I, I got a no hitchhiker up. rule. He's a Hasidic guy. It's none, of my, none of my business. I know, but he's got too many. He couldn't chase you. He's too weighed down by all those accoutrements. Mm, you know, and ringlets. He's, got, he's ringlets and his heavy hat and his, you know, his, his yeah. all his. But his, those could also be used easily as a weapon. Yeah, but of course, like, when you pick up, what is the rule is when you pick up a hitchhiker, you point a gun at them the whole time. Oh, okay. Uh, and cause then you're like, it's, it's, you're actually, I've kidnapped you. But. The uh, another someone someone else I know a woman picked up a Hasidic guy whose car had broken down and refused to talk to her the whole time um, until she dropped him off. Another guy I know we used to buy coke from Hasidic guy. I mean they're 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 rocking. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And, Again, uh, not trying to sound any type. Yeah, of Yeah, what way. do you mean by that? They're well, everywhere. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hello, my name is Brace. I'm Liz. I'm Liz. I'm Liz, too. And, of course, we are joined by Young Chomsky, and the podcast is called... It's called True Anon. Band for Truth. Band for Truth Anon. Maybe we should talk about that Friday more. Yeah, we maybe we got something in the works. We'll see. We got something see. maybe in the works for that. People can wait. Just wait. Hey, just wait. That's going to be my new thing. More will be. Um, but for funsies' sake, we'll say we are recording this this morning. Got a uh, got a little no tiff on the cell the the cellular device that the True Anon account there. was banned. Banned for truth. Banned from I, Twitter. I always I just assume banned for truth. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a lot of lot of lot of weird a lot stuff. Of weirdness, going on there. A lot of weirdness. A lot of funny business on our end. I will say that. A lot of funny business. That's what I'm saying. You know what I think it is? It's because obviously, Grok's woke. Grok's woke. Yeah, it's uh, it's due to Grok. Elon probably asked Grok, "What's the least woke account on Twitter?" And they mm. pointed out mine, oh or actually God. not mine, so yeah. our account, uh, <laughs> which are, of course our unpaid intern is the one who tweets from. Of course. Uh, and which we all have access to. We all have access to. And uh, and if just axed it immediately. Yeah. And so that's it's Grok's fault. We're blaming Grok for that. But we were, sa- we were rescued, saved, probably also by the woke. My new thing is that the woke taketh and the woke giveth. We, to the, us, the woke is like a, 
I it's like really it's like it primitive fire worship that mm. we do. Like we don't understand. We understand that the 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 woke is a source of both sustenance and warmth, yes. but is also something that is great terror. Yes, that that comes and possibly burns the home. It's like the force. It's the force. It's like the force. Well, it is or, crazy that something so magnificent, Hasidic tunnel. Video day, yeah, could happen at the same time as something so terrible. True and on Twitter well, account only, banned. Need, I was the I was the only person who could get to the bottom of the Hasidic tunnel, <laughs> and I will get to the bottom of the Hasidic tunnel unless they have. I should just go there after this. Yeah, um, see what's up. Yeah, I just really be should. like, hey, what's going on down there? What's going on in the Hasidic or, tunnel? Or here's a new one: dig yourself to the tunnel. I just – it's crazy to me to dig to a tunnel. tunnel in the middle of the city because I'm like, there's shit down there. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's like it took them a year. And like – it's impressive. But like there's pipes and there's like, you know, electricity things and there's the foundations of the building which do appear to not be doing super good yeah. after that. Yeah. Uh, and it's just <laughs> – to have the, the, the you gotta crawl like space. You got to like really be committed to tunnel for a year. You really got to do You know, it. to just like be like, you know what, and take your shovel to the wall repeatedly over and over. Like, I get prison, obviously, yeah, breaking out. So it really, you know, makes you question how they're feeling about being inside the center. Well, I, <laughs> I will say, too, it's been crazy to see people be like, do like Jewish conspiracy theories about these guys in particular. Because you're like, <laughs> no, you're thinking of like the our kind of Jewish people who like – interact with the world more. Oh, you know what right. I mean? Like these not are this, like these weirdos. These are like not <laughs> Yeah, these guys are freaky. Guys, like your conspiracy theories about like you're you're literally picking yeah. the like the like the they're I mean, you know, they're they're they're, they're not they don't get out much. They're not really doing a whole lot in the world. Uh, yeah, they're tunneling. They're like tunneling. Like these guys, they these literally are, the guys are not are getting spending, out. These they're are like getting 18 in. Eighteen year old dudes like tunneling in the they're side. They're going of deeper Chabad. in. Stay um, and trying to find mole women to mate with. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but, yeah. And you know what? Maybe they did. Maybe they did. I would depend on the mole woman, but there's some good ones out there. We actually have to for you today a story. You know what? Much like the one told by the very existence of this podcast of cooperation between both genders and religions mm. and different nationalities. Yeah. Now, Liz, I want you to take off that black hundreds uh, accoutrement you're wearing. This is the second time we've used accoutrement. Hundreds? It's black hundreds. What is that? It's like the uh, anti-Semitic Orthodox. Oh, uh, okay. Like Russian Orthodox people uh, from early 20th century who were sort of like the oh, right. bulwark of reaction sure. against both Jews and then, of course, right, of course. Soviets. Yeah. Um, and you're wearing, for some reason, yeah. full garb. Yeah. Uh, I would like you to put normal clothes on. And mm-hmm. jump in the time machine with me because we're going back to 1911. So picture this. 1911. The world is getting ready to get ready for World War I. And in the run-up for that, Italian troops invade Libya, which at the time was a vilayet under the Ottomans. A short war saw the Italians in tentative control of the country. Now, it's funny to imagine the Italians and the Ottomans fighting back then because I can't imagine either. It was a very expert army. Well, I was going to say tentative is kind of a – tentative control is it's a real operable term for anything having to do with the Italians. Yes, yes. <laughs> Especially yeah. around this time. Yeah, yeah. So in eastern Libya, the al Hassa tribe, trained by the Ottomans, fought the Italian invaders. One member of the tribe, don't raise your eyebrow like that at me, Liz. One member of the tribe was Sheikh Igtit Musa al Hassi, a horseman who fought running battles against the Italians in the years after their invasion. Libya eventually lost the war to the Italians, or rather, like the Libyan irregulars eventually lost the war to the Italians, though much of the countryside was not governed by the colonizers. The king of Libya went into exile, and Italy began the process of sending Italians to the colony. Italy, like many colonizing powers, was heavily reliant on colonial troops, meaning like local native troops that they used to, uh, you know, to burnish their forces with. And though the Libyans revolted many times, it was the Second World War that actually knocked the Italians out of there. So the king of Libya comes back after the war and the country becomes a corrupt, backwards sheikdom that is sort of held together by bribes and tribal allegiances. The discovery of oil and the newfound oil wealth that came with that went to the elite. The poor were subsistence farmers or city proletarians. Colonel Gaddafi. Hold on. 
We should put like a little he bit needs of music. A note in this. He needs a we, yeah, he motif, needs, he a needs a motif. What do we call it? Late motif. Thank a you. late motif. He needs a late motif. We need all of them, all three. Colonel Gaddafi, the enterprising head of the Free Officers Movement, overthrows the decadent and corrupt King Idris in 1969. His syncretic philosophy and compelling personality boosted Libya's stocks among TV watchers for decades. But he has his detractors. A group of army officers tried to coup the coup a couple months after Gaddafi took power. They were imprisoned, and included among them was Dr. Sheikh Hassan Othman Igtet, reportedly one of the first PhDs in Libya. Iktet was released and exiled to Pakistan, where his family reports that Gaddafi's agents smothered him to death. Oh, man. Why do you got to do that? What, to Pakistan? Pakistan. I'm sorry. It's a name. You can pronounce it any way you'd like. Now, Gaddafi, as people know, is a friend of the show. We do love Colonel Gaddafi. Yeah. We are not. It's not like an ironic thing. I like Gaddafi. Yeah. I mean, he did some things I don't like, and he did some things I really like. And overall, I think he was at least more interesting than many world leaders. He definitely had style. He once assembled 200 beautiful models in Italy and lectured them on the Quran for hours. He would run out backyards and assemble Bedouin-style tents instead of staying in fancy hotels. In one instance, he was thwarted from doing that in New Jersey by Rabbi Shmuley Botiak, which is not germane to this episode, but which I found out the other day and I think is very funny. The Shmuleys keep popping up. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> it's going to keep happening this episode. I'm sorry. We're, it's going to keep happening this episode. This episode is mostly about a Muslim guy. Oh, and there's a, definitely another. Yeah, yeah, well, okay, fair enough. He gave guns to the National Democratic Front in the Philippines, but on October 20th, 2011, Hillary Clinton had Colonel Gaddafi killed for trying to start the United States of Africa. Libya was plunged into civil war. Only one man could save it. Bazit Igtet, descended from these Libyan rebels, a businessman living in Switzerland, married to the beautiful, entrancing, listen, beauty subjective, Sarah Bronfman of the Seagram's Fortune and a high-ranking member of the sex, self, help, cult, Nexium. Nexium. Now, we have never done an episode on Nexium. We have it. For no. a couple reasons. Well, uh, one, it's it's rather well-trod territory. Yes, that was my number one reason. Also, I think when we started the podcast... Or like right when we started the podcast. We were doing First of all, we were, we were really looking at the other guy, Epstein. But also the HBO show was like coming yeah, out and it seemed like, like everyone was talking Nexium, Nexium, Nexium. So we never did it. But I had forgotten <laughs> some of the details about Nexium. Holy shit. Yes. I, I mean, the one thing that, and we're finally doing it, the one thing that we've always talked about doing in relation to Nexium mm-hmm. was Nexium's, a, a little bit maybe about Nexium's foreign policy, but specifically Nexium's attempt to take over the war in, or the post Gaddafi war torn yes. Libya. Literally to start a United States of Africa. Literally, this is Nexium, Keith Raniere, Sarah Bronfen, and Bezit Igtet's attempt to start the United States of Africa. And unfortunately, Liz. Like many of our our most treasured topics on this podcast, their attempt to form the United States of Africa failed. Yeah, it failed. Okay, so to kind of get into this real quick, we're going to have to do some recapping. I'm going to try and rush through some of this recapping. So let's talk about Sarah Bronfman. Mm-hmm. Okay, Sarah Bronfman, granddaughter of Samuel Bronfman. It's worth talking a little bit about the Bronfmans because it's been, I think, a couple years since mm-hmm. we've talked about them on the show, of course, myself, I talk about them all the time in sort of meme format. Um, but Samuel Bronfman, uh, old-timey guy, cut his teeth selling liquor during Prohibition. So old-timey guy, right? Old-timey he guy. was operating out of Montreal and right on the border started distributing basically through, you know, through networks that he set up on the East Coast, through the Northeast. Now, if you know anything about prohibition, you know anything about, you know, smuggling booze Mm -hmm. during this time, you'd know that it involved working with the mob. The mafia. The mafia. This This man was mobbed up. 
Um, he worked with Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, Al Capone. This is the milieu that this guy's in, right? So he buys a local distillery called Joseph E. Seagram's and Sons, late 20s, expands it. That becomes what everyone knows as the Seagram's Corporation, which is really, I mean, it low-key fell off, which we'll all talk about a little bit. But it was an icon of the 20th century. Seven and seven. Seven and seven. It was... I mean, especially thanks to this network that he set up during Prohibition with the mom. Um, and obviously the other entities involved in that, da, 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 too much for this podcast. But uh, it had a massive distribution network. He's mm. in like 150 countries. He's controlling close to one-fifth of the U.S. liquor market, which is like the perfect percentage, obviously, for liquor. A fifth. Okay, yeah. You like I that one? It. I do, yeah. Um, I will, I just as a little note, as a little nod, uh, we should say that there's a lot of speculation that they also, after liquor became legal again, after the repeal of prohibition, that they expanded and continued some of these, um, activities and networks, uh, along the narcotics side of things. But that's like, obviously for another episode or something like that, but I just want to make a nod to that. Okay. So the Bronfman family, the Seagram's family, we could say, uh, is very big and has a very large family tree and is very confusing. Mm -hmm. But from here, Sam has four kids. Minda, which Pause. is a name. The crazy. Minda, Phyllis, Edgar, and Charles. Okay. So first, Edgar. He's the one who becomes president of Seagram's in 1957. And this is like, you know, the, Seagram, the Seagram's building is like an icon of New York City. It is the kind of like classic – I always think of it as like a Mad Men company. Yeah. Right? Edgar's first I, – I just am trying – I want to like paint a little picture without getting a little too, too into the weeds. Edgar's first wife is a woman named Anne Loeb who is herself the daughter of a man named John Loeb, who was a really big Wall Street executive, old school, like, bank, <laughs> banker, Wall Street family. Um, and her mother was Frances Lehman, as in the family of the Lehman brothers. The Lehman brothers. Yes, the Lehman mothers. Um, so it's just to kind of give a sense of how linked up this family is in society circles, wealth, power, all of those exciting things. So Edgar later re remarries three times. He has seven kids in total, which is a crazy amount of kids. Um, the two we care about here, Sarah and Claire. Sarah Bromfman and Claire Bromfman, born in 76, 79. Okay. There is, I, will, I just really briefly, again, there's going to be a couple tangents here. Uh, a very fun half-brother, Edgar Jr., who is very mi mildly interesting, I'll say, because he basically squanders the entire family fortune by getting in bed with a Frenchman Pause. who may or may not have tried to steal the Rothko out of the Seagram's building. Respect. Um, which is very funny. So there's so much to say about the Bronfman family. There's that story about the French businessman. There's Edgar Jr.'s failed music career. Here's some lyrics. I want to hold your body next to mine. I want to hurry love and take my time. Uh, there were fake kidnapping attempts that led to a fake $4 billion extortion attempt. There were desperate plans to buy up oil and chemical companies. That led to an SEC investigation uh, into insider trading at Bear Stearns, which, of course, deposed a young Jeffrey E. Epstein who was handling some of that account. The founding of this thing called Birthright uh, was, the thing, was thanks to Charles. Charles, uh, I almost called him Charles Seagram's Charles Bromfman. So he used to thank for like, I would say a good 40% of young Jewish people losing their virginity to an IDF officer. Yeah, he was a co-founder of the Mega Group. Yes. Been years since we've talked about this, mm -hmm. um, but that was alongside the guy who maybe got a little sexually freaky with the aforementioned Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, Leslie Wexner. Yes. Yeah, which, by the way, we should we haven't asked for this in a while. If you have any information about gay sex between Leslie Wexner and Jeffrey Epstein, please let us know. <laughs> Real information, too, not... Yeah, Twitter account's back up, do, so you can hit the yeah, DMs. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also... All, there's just so much with this family. An important detail here, and I, you know, I mentioned this, is that under the stewardship of Edgar Jr., the family lost a shit ton of money. Like, 
they had a, a lot of money to begin with, one of the wealthiest families in the world. Um, but they lost about two thirds of their fortune right around the same time that Claire and Sarah start giving away their entire trust fund to Nexium. This ended up with uh, Edgar Sr., basically the dad, their dad, not being on speaking terms with their daughters. And he was famously quoted in this like 2003, it was a very famous piece. Yeah. There's a cover Forbes. article about Keith Raniere and Nexium. Um, in Forbes magazine, and he was quoted as saying, I think this is a cult, which is crazy when you consider it took like <laughs> over a decade for charges to be brought against Keith. Yeah, and that was actually a pretty, I mean, that that 2003 article comes up again in this episode, but that was very formative in Nexium's mindset going into the next decade. Yes. Uh, and really fucking fucked them up pretty bad, like internally, and started making them go even crazier. Absolutely. So Sarah joins a little bit of background here with Nexium. Sarah joins Nexium first uh, in 2002. At this time, it was called Executive Success Programs (ESP). I think everybody knows what Nexium is, um, but if you don't, for some reason, just imagine Scientology if it were Herbalife for nailing a job interview. But, like, also weird sex stuff. Yeah, plus the sex stuff yeah. as well. Yeah. And the sashes. Yes. So they started basically by offering um, intensive workshops. They would These things would cost, like, 8K. If you, it's, so, it's so much like Scientology. It's crazy. Um, and you would learn all of these weird self-improvement techniques. It was kind of modeled after, a, I would say, a blend of hypnosis and Rand. There's mm-hmm. definitely a lot of Anne Rand in there. The and kind of like neuro-linguistic programming, which is basically crude behavioral modification techniques. Yeah, it's a, it's like a form of like, I mean, I've never taken any like self-help programs or anything like that. Yeah. But it seems like, a, like so like that est kind of like yes. mindset, like spiritual business, uh, like I am trying to brainwash myself, but then I'm also getting like double layer brainwashed by yes. the guy in charge of the cult. All of this shit follows in the same kind of line or out of the same sort of line as a lot of the shit that we talked about in the our series The Game. Out of kind of human uh, potential movements. Yeah. And uh, est. Yeah, yeah, est and weird... Um, yeah, like, like you say, self improvement, self and behavioral modification cults. Yeah, basically. like at, at the Esalen sort of mindset, as mm-hmm. you know, by done by Silicon Valley kind of guys. I do want to just real quick point out that um, Keith Raniere hit on a woman by saying, "You're Dagny," uh, oh. which just really goes to show how useless and creepy anyone who follows Ann Rand is. You're Dagny. Um, That's crazy. Does that work? <laughs> No, no. I don't think it worked on this woman. Keith Raniere is a fucking freak, obviously, um, who is now in jail for a very long time, but is also a fraudster and a liar. He allegedly once claimed that he was in the Guinness Book of World Records for highest IQ, which is very— So sick. Sounds like a kind of very spelled in line. You think that I would say that? I would say that I would be mm, – that is kind of something I would say. No, I would say something – you have to say like your lie has to be so stupid that no one would believe that you're lying. But that one's pretty stupid. No, I would – no, I know that's – but like that's – like that's like, also easily you're just like, like – okay, I've got – you know, Bray Scott has that one weird toe. No, I would say something like this. With the extra toe. I would say it's something like this. Yeah, I would be like I actually am in – I was – you could either say something like I had extra toes removed at birth or I was in the Guinness Bur- Book of World Record because I had the longest chest hair at a foot and a half. It was like one <laughs> long silver hair that came out of me. Uh, and it was in previous editions of the Guinness Book of World Records. They took it out when like people stopped, obviously like stopped buying books as much. Um, but it's still on the website, like a cash version of the older website. I gotta I'll send s- you the link later. That's something you got to say too. <laughs> I gotta I'll s- send you the link later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do. I really think that when I was a kid, I thought that the Guinness Book of World Records would be a bigger deal than it turned out to be. Well, n- you can just buy your way. Like that's a, it, really? it's like a thing. Yeah, it's just it's a way. Pay for it's play? just it's all pay for play. Yeah, but also my question is this: Who are the? How are these people taking these IQ tests? Have you guys ever had an IQ test? No, no. Why? Who, where do you get them? 
How, I don't know. Like I got you can get crazy tests online. I mean, I but like it's like I wouldn't. Everyone's believe getting that. Dutch tests these days. I got I got tested. I've talked about this on the show before. But I got my intellect did get tested. It wasn't IQ intellect? Test. Yeah, like or not my intellect. It was like my like ability to comprehend things was tested. And I got like r- like the highest possible ones in. I didn't tell you guys this. No, I got like yeah. the highest possible ones in like the obvious ones, like verbal and you know like comprehensive sentences, all that kind of stuff. And then my ones with math were so bad that the lady legitimately thought I was, uh, you know. Aww. Yeah. And they were like, they like took me aside and they're like, oh, like if you go to college, like you actually, congratulations, like you actually can probably get out of a lot of classes Stop. because of this, because the discrepancy is like four quadrants or whatever. What like is this can, test? I don't remember what it was called, but uh, interesting. Yeah. I've had my Thetans tested, but that's about it. Mm. That, that's the science. Yeah, yeah. I have two actually. <laughs> Took the Voigtkampf test. I used to do that at Powell uh, Powell Street Station when the Scientology people were there. Um, back to Keith Raniere. So he's yeah, he's a total freak. He had a. I want this is important to point out for understanding his relationship with Claire and Sarah, and really the Bromfman family is that. Um, what he had, what has been described in court documents as a pathological addiction to day trading. So sick, and not only was he pathologically addicted to day trading, he was horrible at it. Yes, yes, he was bad. He uh, he apparently, but he had sixty five million dollars worth of commodities losses, commodity trading losses, which he apparently blamed on Edgar Bronfman saying that he rigged the oats futures market in order to poison his relationship with his daughters. Because at, at this point... Like with Claire and Sarah. Sarah I mean. Sarah's sister Claire is also in Nexium. Yes. And ends up actually doing going pretty far Which, in Nexium. By the way, like we, we, you have to put like three parentheses around the rigged oats futures market. We have to put three and, parentheses? Well, no, we don't. We, okay, because he's saying the Jews rigged the That's – oh, it, it sounds it, – okay, Keith he, Raniere is saying the Bronfmans rigged the stock market is like very parentheses coded. But my question is, is like you got to really like buy your own bullshit to be like some guy. Like Keith Raniere was not like an economic genius or whatever, was not like this like – titan of trading he was just like a fucking schmuck no he's a degen and you but you have to believe in yourself if you're like i'm gonna strike it rich on the oats futures market dude like that's like a different level of gooning yeah that's that's like that's that there's a faith in that that i think would be inspiring even to those brothers of mine not yours but mine that are in tunnels in crown heights so Sarah was very involved in Nexium operations, not on the level that Claire ended up being, and that's like very well documented. Um, but I do think that some survivors would dispute some of the ways that Sarah ends up portraying Definitely. her role in kind of the day-to-day operations of Nexium. I'll say this: from everything that I've read, and it's actually it's it's kind of funny to read because like I was reading this Nexium book. Uh, there's that you know, big Vanity Fair article about the sisters. There's like a couple other. I think there's a New York Times piece about the sisters that, as well. Yeah, that was the big one that kind of it, it, kicked off. Every all the... every one of them that I've read, they're always like Claire is like not very charismatic and she's kind of busted. Sarah's beautiful, which citation needed, but you know what? I the beholder, but also subjective, mm. uh, it, which is I the beholder. But anyways, uh, Sarah like Sarah is like portrayed as being like very charismatic. Outgoing, beautiful, right. and Claire is kind of like the ugly duckling. Yeah, they don't look that different to me, to be honest with you. Well, you got the classic dark hair, blonde hair. You got the dark hair, blonde. But she's hair. more of a strawberry blonde, I think. <laughs> yeah, you, just you thinking would be correct out loud. Um, but uh, but Sarah, I do from some of her post Nexium activities, I do think that she was just she's just a smoother operator than Claire was, and and I think that. While she like yeah. was she she had her a different place in the organization than Claire might have. So TLDR, Keith Raniere ends up in prison on sex trafficking and other charges. There's a bunch of charges. The feds uh, charge Claire, but not Sarah. This is from one of the many court documents uh, on the case from the U.S. attorneys. I'm just going to read this quote. There can be little doubt that Raniere would have been able to commit the crimes with which he was convicted were if it not for powerful allies like Claire Bromfman. She pursued Raniere's accusers and critics. 
by dispatching powerful teams of lawyers, private investigators, public relations firms to attempt to discredit them and dredge up information that could be used to undermine their claims. Even now, after Ranieri's convictions for sex trafficking, forced labor, alien smuggling, and child exploitation offenses, Bronfman continues to support Ranieri. Um, the, the kind of bankrolling of the, all the PR efforts really can't be understated. They were pouring close to like $2 million a month retaining services from Roger Stone, yep. which is insane, especially when you get into the weeds on the family tree and all the buddies and friends that pop up along the way, um, and funneling money to political candidates to attract like good favor over the years, which like I was reading about this, and I got to say – It makes you think what would have, like, become of Sam Bankman-Fried if FTX hadn't gone the way it did. How do you mean? Like, this is like – like, do you think that he – there would have been a Nexium-type situation with Sam? I have no idea, but it wouldn't have surprised me considering the way he, like, went after critics, the way that he, like, focused all of his attention on, like, massive, massive media – like pushes and obsessions and buying people off. I mean, Nexium was the same way. I, you know? I, I will say, I do think SBF's days were thing. numbered from the beginning just because he was irredeemably weird. Like there was no... Well, he was a failure, yeah, absolutely. He was a, I mean, he, the guy's just a freak, but there was like no amount of money that could insulate him from his freakness. Mm. And so like it would have, cra- he would have crashed and burned. And he, he was just too, he was too online. He was too online, Like here's yeah. the thing. If you're going to have a successful cult, which... Potential cult leaders, don't listen to this. Don't listen. And you shouldn't be listening to podcasts anyways. No. Here nor there. But you got to be offline. Yeah, you got to be offline. Like Sam was like way too online and and would just give his whole game away if he was really attempting to like build out an effective altruist, you know, commune, compound style, bohemian oasis for weird like crypto scams, polyamory, and money laundering. Look at Black Hammer's most successful time as a cult. It's when they were in Atlanta, and they were going crazy, and they were beating, sodomizing, yeah. threatening uh, each other. Only a little bit of that was shown online. And they had their shooters online, but, but, but the, the main guy, not so online. And yeah. so that's important. The main guy has kind of got to be insulated a little bit. Yeah. And and that's – that's Ranieri did do a decent job with that. He had kind of these these moneyed lieutenants do a lot of his dirty work for oh, him. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. So Claire Bromfin, she pleads guilty to a litany of charges, sentenced to close to seven years. Sarah immediately cooperates with the feds, <laughs> which – you know. She throws her sister to the wolves, yeah. Yeah, um, and she wasn't charged. Witnesses were testifying saying that she was really, you know, part of Keith's close-knit circle and more of a key player, um, which I am, like, also tempted to believe given the amount of money she was pouring into the thing. I think so, too. Drained her trust fund, drained her almost close to draining her inheritance, which is when the, you're talking about the Bronfman family fund, the money— is an absurd amount. I mean, they poured like all, over $150 million into this. This is this is what I would like to put forward here. And this is, I think, part of the thrust of this episode in general. I do think Sarah had a very high-ranking place. I mean, we know that she had a high-ranking place. But I do think she was as close to uh, Rainier as, as Claire was. Yeah. But I think her mission was different. Well, one thing is... You know, in looking into her, I got to say, she was obsessed with the Dalai Lama, which to me is a red flag. Well, let's not get crazy here because I'm a little bit obsessed with the Dalai Lama too, but in a different – I hate the Dalai Lama. Well, but that's different. That's different, yeah. That's the that's opposite. Different. She is – it's so strange to me whenever I see somebody like a, 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 a – I'll say this. Whenever I see somebody who isn't like from Tibet or like follow like the da, like the sort of – and I use this word again, syncretic brand of Buddhism yeah. that, that the Dalai Lama comes out of uh, that's, that, that exists in Tibet. I like views him as like this font of wisdom because the guy is, is not all that. Unless you're from the 1960s, I think it's weird. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I do know what you mean. Um, you know, reading interviews with Sarah, I got to be honest, she seems like a fucking moron. Um, she, this is a, I was literally in my bedroom one day listening to his tapes, talking about the Dalai Lama, and thought to myself, wow, this guy's amazing. It's like, that's what you're thinking to yourself? This is from a piece um, that friend of the show, 
I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, Mo, Ta- how do I say this? Uh, Mo Tucker, the drummer of the Velvet Underground. <laughs> no, of course, collaborate with Sun City Girls. Uh, Mo T- Ch- T- Kakchik, Chakik, Chakik, T K A C. Oh, you can pronounce Mo it. Mo Chakik. I don't know. Kachik. I'm so sorry, Mo. Kachik. Um They wrote back in 2010 before any federal charges against uh, Sarah or Claire or Keith. Um, The way he looks at things, this is uh, Sarah talking about the Dalai Lama. The way he looks at things is very scientific and very much in line with the philosophy of Nexium. Not good branding for the Dalai Lama, by the way. I said, well, that kind of sounds like what we do. And I thought, maybe I could introduce myself and bring him here and introduce him to Keith. Because I think Keith is a scientist and a great philosopher. And so this was a big thing. She was able to get the Dalai Lama to the Nexium compound in Albany after a bunch of back and forth. If you watch The Vow, there is some of this in there Mm -hmm. um, in the series. And His Holiness, as he's referred to, originally canceled his appearance because the cult was getting all this bad press. (laughs) And it wasn't until Keith, Sarah, and then Nancy Salzman, who's the other co-founder of Nexium along with Keith, went to... Dara Masala, which is like the little, uh, you know, the little, I guess, compound, city, town, enclave where the Dalai Lama is, where all the Tibetan monks are, um, to, to meet up with him. And they were able to get him to come to Albany in 2009. And this may have been because Sarah maybe had an affair with one of the Dalai Lama's aides. So I have well, – this has been known for a while, but I haven't really thought about this in a deep way until recently, which is – this brings up the question of whether the Dalai Lama himself can fuck. Well, do you mean like has the capability to or is allowed to? Well, due to his ex- – well, I don't know because I was about to say due to his advanced age, I would doubt he could anymore. But I did know a guy who unfortunately – has, and this is not a joke and it, it is sad, did go in um, insane. Uh, I knew a guy who was a crazy Buddhist who said that his master could come off of a cliff and suck it back in his penis. <laughs> I'm not joking. He said that he told me this in a closet in Pittsburgh in 2008. Uh, My understanding is that they have to take a vow of poverty and a vow of celibacy. Well, the llamas are de- – the I don't know if the Tibetan <laughs> llamas are taking a vow of poverty because these motherfuckers live like – I mean they live oh, like Oh, I kings. know. But my understanding is that's that's sort of the – you know, at least forward-facing. Well, I, I, I was researching this a couple of days ago. And as far as I can understand, the one time in recent history – I'm sure that it's happened before, but – in, in cursory research in recent history, the Dalai Lama was asked about sex, about whether he's had it, was uh, I believe in 2012 in an interview in Africa with an African outlet where they asked him if the Dalai Lama misses sex. And the Dalai Lama is, is rather straightforward and says he doesn't. But he kind of squiggles out of the question of whether he have, has ever had sex before. Do now, they ask him straight up? They ask him – well, they ask him if he misses sex. Now, I would like to put forth that this is – this next thing I want to say is based completely on vibes, I guess you could say. That's most of our podcast. And a gut feeling. Is that I, I would say that without a doubt, most Dalai Lamas, including his current holiness and the ones prior, were very certainly most likely molested. Uh, whether the Dalai Lama in his adulthood sought out the company of men or women uh, is, is unknown to me. But I'm going to say that I think the Dalai Lama has fucked. He has that crazy kissy pokey move with his tongue. Well, he's got the, he did kiss that kid's tongue, but I I think that the Dalai Lama has had sex, has had consensual sex with a adult woman in his life. I'm gonna say that. Uh, maybe I call me crazy, but I think the Dalai Lama. No, is you know what? I'm gonna say that I've never thought about it, and I'm not gonna think about it right now. But what I am gonna say is that if you have information on whether or not the Dalai Lama has had sex, hit the DMs. Hit the DMs. Hit the DMs. Because um. You know, we like to bring people the news and the straight facts. And whether the Dalai Lama's pickled pecker is within his saffron robes or not, certainly his attache in America was sticking his freaky little thing in every which way that a vagina would take it. (laughs) 
Sorry. Jesus when I started that sentence, Christ. I didn't know it was going to end up. Oh I didn't mean God. to. I, I genuinely, I was like trying to, as you could see, I slowed down during the sentence trying you to change know where course. didn't know to go. Every which way. Then I was like, I don't know how there's to. There's nowhere to go with that There's nowhere one. to go with that except straight right in the vagina, <laughs> which is the main place that I believe statistically, obviously I'm not saying this from actual experience, but statistically that the Dalai Lama's man in the U.S. would have put his penis. Tenzin Dondon. This is the Dalai Lama's, like, U.S. guy. Yeah. He is, or his, what they call the personal emissary of peace, which is not a thing. Um, his job was basically to meet with celebrities and business leaders, philanthropists, so on, people with money and power, and screen them for the Dalai Lama, I guess. I don't think that there's any – there's no reason for this being a thing. I got to be honest. If you follow Tibetan Buddhism, you got to hate the Dalai Lama because all the Dalai Lama does is like hang out with like – well, Richard Branson's a bad example actually. But like you just hang out with like rich celebrities and shit like that. Yeah. This guy, Tenzin Dundon, he's the guy he, – he would just like vet people and be like, hmm – are you someone who should meet with the Dalai Lama? And the other people on the other side are like, oh, I want to meet the Dalai Lama so bad. I want to be. And then t- it comes out, obviously, later, the most obvious consequence of this comes out in 2017 that Tenzin Dondon, not only was he possibly, maybe, getting freaky with Sarah Bronfman, but was like, oh, if you want to meet the Dalai Lama, rich United States celebrity, like perhaps Bono or Leonardo DiCaprio, I'm assuming, two people who have met the Dalai Lama. Bono's not from the United States. Well, he probably has a house in LA. Probably has a house there. You got to pay me because I'm the gatekeeper. So this dude was literally like charging rich people, skimming off the top, to meet the Dalai Lama, which... Respect. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's an economy of middlemen. The Dalai Lama's a racket, dude. Or you're out. You're in or you're out. Yeah. I mean, listen, this isn't, frankly, that different from how Lamaism has operated for much of its uh, history, right? It's that you have these, like, priests or that monks that are are sort of – like the Lama is – the Dalai Lama has been, always been kind of an industry within Tibet. And now he's an industry with, outside of Tibet. And he should be glad for that. He's a hustler. But yes, the, the rumor is – and I – there's a lot to back this rumor up to yes. be clear. It's not just like some people are saying. There's a lot to back this up. That Sarah Bronfman was fucking the Dalai Lama's man in America, Tenzin Don. Now, was it love was it simply a way to get the Dalai Lama to Nexium? We shall never know. Could he do some of those freaking dicky Kundalini moves? You know, <laughs> could he? Could he? Could he bend it like Beckham? Could he fucking? Could he do some tantric shit to a freaking thing? Sting. Sting. Ooh, that's is that a move? Rocks. Remember Sting and his Sting's tantric. That was the whole thing. That's like the most famous thing about Sting. Besides, like the police would probably be the most. You don't have to wear- no, post police. Oh. Yeah, I don't really know what he's been doing after that. Well, he's been doing tantric sex. I always associate for like, him. well, it's tantric, so it's like for years, yeah. really? decades. The le- Why do you think you don't see hand- Sting anymore? He's, he's too busy, busy. He's having sex. Yes. <laughs> well, the Dalai Lama also. I mean, listen, there was the meeting in Albany. But he also wrote a forward to one of Keith Raniere's books. Yes. So, like, there was clearly something was happening here. Yeah, same year. Same year all this went down. The affair, the speech at Albany, and the foreword to Keith Raniere's book, which, can you please read the title of this? It is called The Sphinx and Tel... I never knew how to pronounce this. The Sphinx and Tel Chepia. Chepia. Tel Chepia. Tel Chepia. The Sphinx and Tel Chepia. You gotta be fucking. Cr- How does the Dalai Lama get involved? Whatever. Dalai Lama is. I don't Dalai know. Lama. I was watching an interview with the Dalai Lama. It was really funny. Did he do like, kissy pokey? No, it was with a. It was with this like South Asian correspondent for BBC who's like kind of taking him to tat. It's like a woke mm. sort of thing, mm. uh, because he said that if the next Dalai Lama should be a woman, that's a good looking woman. But like, it's obviously he's kidding because like that'll like get the da- the Lama cause like. You know, that'll boost the cause. Uh. But, like, you know, he's like an old guy. Like, it's it's not – it's a 
I guess a stupid thing to say, but it's the fucking Dalai Lama who gives a fuck. Like, yeah, totally. He s- sucks. Yeah. Everything he says is stupid. Uh, and she's like, did you mean that? He's like, is it, she's like, isn't that a little sexist? And he's just like, He's like, I'm the I Dalai think it's Lama. funny. I think she should be attractive. <laughs> <laughs> like, or he should too. The man should. And she's like, but isn't isn't like it better to be pretty on the inside? But he's like, but the outside it helps as well. Like he's not, <laughs> he feels very like an old Jewish man to me in that context. Too. I mean, I gotta say, he's kind of like he sees him. But then Literally, he also like he says he something him. really funny in the interview as well. He's like, Europe should be for Europeans. Like it shouldn't be Muslim. There's too many of them there. They should send some of them back after training them. After and training like, them? After training them. They should say, which is, okay, that I've kind of done that a little bit. Um, I want to put a pin on the Dalai Lama's uh, uh, emissary's penis for a second. <laughs> kind of nail it to the wall like a butterfly of yore. Uh, and I want to talk about a different foreign individual that Nexium had some dealings with that do involve the Bronfman uh, sisters. And it's a long story. So, like you mentioned, in 2003, there was a very highly, badly negative Forbes cover article about Nexium. Yes. Now, the way that this uh, the the journalist writing this article operated, uh, and the way that many journalists operate is that it was kind of like you know the the interviewees, which are many people in Nexium, including Keith Raniere, thought they were going to be in for some positive press. Yes. And then when the article came out, it was resoundingly negative and yeah. featured this Whoop. Edgar Bromfman quote. Chair pulled out from beneath you. Exactly. And so, you know, the, 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 this is not a, like, this is a time when the wagons are getting circled and everyone's like getting much more paranoid. It's also should mention, you know, Keith Rainier's day trading habit and the Bromfman sisters are coming in and like, he's, he's got to get them in the dad's against this. And it's just, it's, it's a fucking mess. And so Nexium employs, a guy named Juval Aviv, who is the owner of a security firm called Interfor, which I love that. I yeah, love it's a great when name. it's called shit like that. And a very controversial Israeli private spook to spy on its enemies. So Juval Aviv is most famous for being hired by Pan Am, the uh, now defunct airline, in relation to a lawsuit by family members of passengers who were killed in the Lockerbie bombing, which was officially blamed on Libya and which Gaddafi eventually took the blame for. Now, Javal put forth a separate uh, argument for what might have gone down. He claimed that it was a combined like Hezbollah, Iran, PFLP, uh, General Command operation in conjunction with the Syrian arms dealer Manzar al Qasar, who was dealing heroin via the airlines, like he was smuggling heroin in baggages on the airlines. Now, in Javal Aviv's claim, the CIA and later he claims the DEA discovered this and were trying to make a deal with al Qasar and the PFLP GC Hezbollah to free hostages in Lebanon. In exchange, they were going to let this heroin flow freely through the airport. So then, and this gets a little hazy there, Iran or the PFLP, GC, then used Turkish Islamists to exchange a heroin bag with a bomb bag, which led to the Lockerbie bombing, which claimed 259 lives. So... To be clear, the the U.S.'s claim here is that Libya did it, that like Libyan right. agents did this. And then this is, this guy who claims to have been or maybe really was an Israeli spy, now private, working for Pan Am, hired by Pan Am, is claiming that the CIA slash DEA's negligence pla- slash permission allowed this bomb on the plane. And this is the guy that Nexium hires. This is the guy that Nexium hires. The U.S. government denies the claims, which were disproven, quote, in court. Libya was blamed, and eventually Gaddafi handed yeah. over a couple of people, blah, 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 Lockerbie bombing. I feel like a lot of people know about that. So <laughs> a little more about Javal's backstory. So he also claims to have been the leader of the uh, vengeance operations that tracked down the black September militants involved in the Munich killings made famous by the movie Munich. He claims to have given a bunch of interviews to George Jonas, who wrote the book Vengeance, which Munich was based off of. So he also claims in court, I mean, at this point, Javal is like, is, is a, is a running this like Wall Street Interfor, like corporate espionage, private intelligence firm. 
He claims in court, Javal Aviv is, 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 is flown to court in Canada and claims in court that Conrad Black, the disgraced Canadian financier and owner of the Jerusalem Post, had tens of millions of dollars hidden in offshore accounts. This was during a huge like fraud trial that Conrad Black was undergoing, which I believe he lost. Uh, you know, yeah, he ended up getting pardoned by Trump, remember? He did end up getting – he was very good friends with Trump. Yeah, he did end up getting pardoned by Trump. Yeah. Um, this is actually – funnily enough, what Javal is explaining here is the kind of stuff that Epstein himself was, was up to, you know, this sort of offshoring of, of and hiding money. Interestingly enough, Conrad Black had previously outbid Charles Bronfman and Robert Maxwell who had combined forces in an offer for the Jerusalem Post – to buy a controlling stake in it in the newspaper in 1989, which is just an interesting little tidbit there. Yeah, a little, a lot of crossover with a lot of these people. And of course, Epstein had worked on the Siegmund's merger, blah blah. blah. Right. One of his big cases at Bear Stearns. Weirdly enough, jo- George Jonas, the guy who wrote Vengeance, uh, which Munich is based off, of, is so close to the Black family that he is going to be buried in the same graveyard plot as them. So if if this is the connection is making a little sense. Javal Aviv was interviewed, so he says, for vengeance by George Jonas and then later testifies against Conrad Black. George Jonas used to be married to Conrad Black's current wife, who, by the way, her fucking biography reads is British spy, if yeah. anyone's does, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, and is so close to the family still that he's going to be buried next to his ex-wife in Very Conrad weird. Black. Very weird. So – Javal himself claims to have been involved with Robert Maxwell. And in fact, there are claims that he was hired by Ghislaine to look into Maxwell's death. Specifically, Javal claims that he was hired by Robert Maxwell to to, uh, basically be involved in the selling of the promised software, which is uh, software that that, – it's a very long story, uh, but basically that – Israel and the U.S. were selling uh, to different com- countries that have sort of this tracking software that had a back door mm-hmm. that was in it. And, and Robert Maxwell was selling the back door software, which is part of the big – one of the main theories as to why he was uh, – might have been killed. Uh, he claims that – Rivalvi claims to be one of the last people that spoke to Danny Casalero before he died. And in 2006 – Javal Aviv wrote a book called Max, which is a book is a fictionalized account of the murder of Robert Maxwell by Israeli agents who are attempting to bl- who, who he is attempting to blackmail over promise software. All these people are just constantly blackmailing each other. It's so fucking crazy. Nexium, like, the Bromfmans, Sam Bromfman, the, you know, I mean, who's peddling alcohol with the mob. They're all blackmailing each other. Yeah, yeah. It's just so insane. Before they start doing it with Hoover. I pause. But yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe. Maybe. There's okay. photos. There's, there's photos. Uh, it's just so like that's such a weird nexus of people, and so the there there's a lot of con. I had first come across Javal Aviv's name in that. I keep wanting to call him Javal McGee, by the way, <laughs> which is McGee. a joke for like maybe thirty of our listeners. I don't know what you're talking about. That's all right. I, I came across him in a book about uh, Robert Maxwell being a Mossad spy. He kind of very much strikes me as an Ari Ben Menashe type figure. Yeah, except less reputable because there's like. There's the complete denial from sources in Israel that he ever worked for Mossad and that, in fact, he might have just been a low-ranking, like, security agent at El Al Airlines. Mm. But also I'm like, would I believe them if they said that? You know? Yeah. It's, like, yeah. it's one of those things you're like – I don't really I don't believe anything they say. I mean I will say he – this man loves to run his mouth. He loves to – I will say this. His – the fact that he talks this much would not make me hire him to be my private but spy. But my thing – I have a question about this because if you're – let's say you're an ex-spy. Yeah. And you have no – you're like, I know that I'm not getting hired again. Either, you know, I got written up too many times or I got fired or nobody wants me, whatever. Do you feel like your only recourse is, one, writing fictionalized accounts of your travels and travails, to running your mouth to anyone that will listen? It's like in that sense, it makes sense to me that it could yeah. be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. I would say that I bet some of this is true and some of this isn't. Like, yeah. I do kind of think he made up the entire PFLP GC, like his his narrative of the Lockerbie bombing. 
does not seem to be true. Mm. But also the U.S. government responded so harshly against him. Like they they, they basically sued him and set him up in this different lawsuit about mm. a completely different deal that he was working on as retaliation for this. Like, and so it's like, well, then why would they do that if he's just some dude that's fucking lying? And like it's it gets very tangled. Uh, you know, I, I Interfor is still around. And I called them yesterday. There was no answer. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it seems like it's run by his possibly his son, mm. Don of Eve. Um, Great name. I'm not really sure who's hiring these guys. Uh, their website does not look great to me. Yeah. Um, but I ordered a copy of his book, Max, which I was unable to find. I mean, I didn't look very hard, but they, he was interviewed on Fox and Friends in 2006 about it, where he claims that the book is actually entirely true, but he had to fictionalize it or else something bad would mm, happen. Much like some of our episodes. And then there's also there's also rumors that George Jonas made up all of Vengeance anyways, that mm. the whole thing's a fucking lie, and that Spielberg... Then Spielberg claims that he uncovered evidence that Javal Aviv is a real ex-Massad spy. So it's it's all tangled. But what does that have to do with Nexium? So Javal Aviv and Interfor were retained by Nexium <laughs> in 2003 after the Forbes article came out. So... In that Forbes article, and certainly in other, I believe in that Forbes article, but in other sort of like contemporary negative articles about Nexium, a famed cult deprogrammer named Rick Ross is, is quoted. I mean, yeah, and Rick Ross is a interesting and rather eccentric individual. We won't go too in deep into all it Rick Rosses. Really. All Rick Rosses. <laughs> yeah, it's really true. All Rick Rosses. It's kind of a cursed name. Uh, yeah. And blessed. And blessed. Yeah. So. Rick Ross uh, had several former Nexium members that he was speaking to. Plus, he was apparently in photographs of Keith Raniere with a red bow tied around his erect penis. Now, we know from leaked WhatsApp messages that Keith Raniere at least claims to have a 7.5-inch penis. Uh, whether that penis I love is, how you say that. Like, we know that. Like, Well, we know that he claims that. I, I can't say. I'm sure that there's a picture. I didn't know he claimed that. He claims that. Well, he claims that because he's talking to a woman who had recently slept with somebody else and uh, that he has also slept with. And she says – and he asks about the other guy's penis. The woman responds that the man's penis is uh, 6.75 inches and, it's, and he asks, is this penis longer than mine? And the woman responds rather timidly, yes. And he says, eh, wrong. You're lying. My penis is 7.5 inches. His is 6.75 inches. Uh, and she's like, how do you know that? And he says that basically implies that guys know things about each other and because they masturbate together, which I want to say for the record is not here. I'm uh, not true and not – I've never jacked off. I know – the only reason I know guys' penis sizes is because I ask them just bluntly straight out and then I measure them. I don't just eyeball it. You don't do like a guesstimate? The guesstimate, yeah. Anyways, uh, Rick Ross basically is building this dossier on Nexium. And Javal Aviv and Interfor, at Keith Rainier's request, compile a dossier on Ross. And then Aviv gets an actress to pose as the wealthy, distraught mother of a Nexium member to fool Ross into meeting. Ross does go to Aviv's office and then, you know, it makes it very clear over the intervening weeks that he refuses to meet with this girl in Nexium alone. That he's like, yeah, there should be like her mother there, somebody who cares about her. Like, I'm not going to meet in the room with her alone. Like, don't worry. And they try to get him to go on a cruise ship to meet the girl. And he sort of backs down. And I think it's just the cruise ship detail is very interesting to me because there are implications certainly in some of the writing about this that the plan might have been to throw Rick Ross off the cruise ship, which would have very much mirrored the book the that Maxwell. Aviv was possibly working on about Robert Maxwell, who he claims that he knew. It would be crazy if that was like his only move. Was to throw the guy off the he ship. He was like – It's a killer move. It though. is. Well, throwing a guy off a cruise ship is even better because they might die from the height, and right. not just like or bang bang on the side or of the bang, ship. Bang bang on the side of the ship. Yeah, you get yeah. a bang bang or a yeah. yeah. Um, so, but also could stow away in the little extra tiny boat they have on the side sometimes, or slip into it. Hmm. So you got to kind of like maybe hit him on the head and then yeah, dump him into the do, drink. There's a Columbo episode. Well, no, that she just killed in the cabin. So <laughs> I just I, that you know the, Aviv is sort of a a a a a a little distant from necessarily what the thrust of this episode is, but I thought it was just so interesting that I we had to go into it for a little bit. Mm-hmm. 
Well, let's get back to Sarah Bronfman because the last time we left her, she was getting freaky with a llama. She was getting, well, yeah, yes. She was getting, she was getting. It's a way to put it. She was getting loved by the llama in the legina. And she has a taste for these, possibly these uh, foreign, you know, ooh, these, these suave foreign gigolos. Uh, but unfortunately, the llama, for some reason or another, stops uh, having crazy, freaky deaky tantric sex with Sarah Bronfman's private parts. There are reports that she's heartbroken, I will say. And enter Bazit Igtit. So if you might recall from the little intro we did for this episode, there were a couple of Igtets in Libya's recent history. Uh, now, a lot of this stuff comes from Bazit Igtet himself, so take it with maybe a grain of salt. But he claims his grandfather was a, uh, an irregular uh, you know, tribal horsemen against the Italians fighting mm. against the colonizer in 1911. It's probably true. Uh, and he claims that his father was uh, one of the first PhDs in Libya and was – there's a couple different stories. There's one that he was like, you know, rose up against Gaddafi and then had to flee the country to Pakistan and he was smothered there by Gaddafi's agents. And then there's another that he was stole millions of dollars from Gaddafi and then fled to Pakistan and Gaddafi's agents Stop. killed him there. Stop doing what? Pronouncing it the way that they liked it to be pronounced? Nevertheless, he died in Pakistan, and Bezit spends West most of his character. life. Bezit is born in Benghazi, which we'll get back wow. to in a little bit, because Benghazi, as both a place and an incident, is uh, germane to the rest of this episode. Mm. So Bezit spends most of the rest of his life in Switzerland. Uh, he seems to be very much a striver for a position as sort of a Middle East go between for European and Gulf business interests. At one point, he's involved with this, like, Middle Eastern gold company that's based in Liechtenstein, uh, and he eventually works for a mega yacht company based out of Switzerland. Uh, he doesn't appear to actually have himself that much money, but mm. he really pumps himself up like he would have a lot of money. Now, I've seen lots of videos of him speaking. He His English is actually, I will say, like, surprisingly really bad. Mm, um, that's weird. I know. It's weird because Switzerland, you'd expect, like, yeah, you know— he, that's like anyway, sort of the, the education there. It, it was just also like the fact that he's also been married to an American woman for a number of years. Like well, she's not very. It's, he's he's very he's very awkward in his speech patterns and his mm. language choice. Um, but he's a handsome guy, you know, um, sort of slight figured, not not maybe the beefiest gentleman. Uh, certainly the 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 monk that Sarah Bronfman had previously been stupping was a little better. Uh, endowed just physically in general. I don't know about his penis length, but you know, I'm talking about perhaps pectoral length. Um, but he doesn't appear to have that much money. And it's unclear exactly how he met Sarah Bronfman. I'm assuming possibly via a Nexium class. I mean, it, it seems like he would take one of their executive workshops. He definitely seems like the type of person who would take their workshops. And Nexium was very interested in recruiting um, you Internationals. Know, internationals. Yeah, Mexico. A couple uh, president's sons were parts yes. of Nexium. I believe Sarah might have even fucked one of them. I mean, they were trafficking in people, so yeah. Yes. So Bazit and Sarah get together. Now, someone else that gets together in, uh, in around the same time, about 2011, is NATO. Uh, when several leaders of NATO countries Unrelated. decide that they are going to kill Muammar Gaddafi for trying to form the United States of Africa. Yeah. So in 2011, amid the rising bloodbath of the Arab Spring, Libya kicks the fuck off. The rebel forces, oftentimes with shady links or themselves outright jihadists, overtake the teeny beleaguered armed forces of Libya. So Libya is actually, and we talk about this extensively in our episode with Felix that we did on Benghazi. Yeah. Called, I believe, Benghazi? No, wasn't it Hillary no, did 9-11? Hillary did 9-11. Yeah, you're right. Mm. My God. Yeah. Um, you know, but but Libya is fairly, like, well-developed. Uh, Gaddafi put a lot of that oil wealth to yeah. good use. Uh, you know, has, has much higher living standards than a lot of its neighboring countries. It's doing very well. At um, that time. At that time. Uh, but Gaddafi, you know, he was a mercurial gentleman, and he— uh, He swung all kinds of ways. 
all kinds. He just, Which he nowadays is, is celebrated. It's celebrated. It's celebrated. The quirkiness that Gaddafi exhibited during much of his career would nowadays be taken as a positive, but at the time was seen as a mark of shame. It just shows you. Just shows you. So Gaddafi lent some money to Sarkozy. Sarkozy wanted, that's the president of France, um, wanted Gaddafi gone before the debts were called in. And so when the heat was turning up on Gaddafi, the French and the Americans and a couple of their little friends too, uh, turned that heat the fuck up. Gaddafi was chased into a ditch and sodomized to death with a knife by jihadists under United States air support. So in that uh, death of Gaddafi, Keith Rainier of Nexium, Sarah Bronfman, and Bezit Igtet sense an opportunity. This country, while suffering from deep trauma and loss, would be perfect for the Nexium group to expand to. We should say that in this moment, there are a lot of people that are salivating over what might come in the like vacuum of power. Yes. That Gaddafi's murder like had revealed, right? Yeah. That there were a lot of people sort of like angling and seeing what could happen, you know, whether it was NGOs, NATO forces, clandestine forces, slave traders, like yeah. you Turkey, name it. Egypt, Russia, America, like everyone's, everyone's like, getting involved. We gotta get the fuck in there. It's a melting we, pot. Because the of thing terrible is, fucking people. Libya's got a lot of fucking oil and money. And so it's like and Gaddafi himself had a huge personal fortune, which we'll get to in a moment. Gaddafi's gold. Gaddafi's gold. Which has a great ring to it. So a month after Gaddafi is killed, Bezit Igtit, who is at this point now just like with Sarah Bronfman, travels to Libya with Sarah and a guy named Adam Hawk plus a man named Joseph Hagen. This is under the banner of uh, of Igtit's newly formed Independent Libya Foundation. So first, there's a lot to get into with that. But first, I want to talk about Joseph Hagen. So he is a little bit like, uh, like Javal Aviv a consultant on security mm. affairs. Interesting. He runs something called Command Consulting. Great name. And this is from an old bio of him, I think taken from the White House website during George W. Bush's term. Can you, can you read this? Joseph, is this like his CV? This is, a li- this is his old CV. Okay. It's, it's since changed. Joseph W. Hagen is assistant to the president and deputy chief of staff. The former deputy campaign manager for Bush Cheney 2000, Mr. Hagen also served in both the George H.W. Bush and Reagan administrations. Mr. Hagen has extensive experience in both the public and private sector. Prior to joining the Bush Cheney 2000 campaign, he was vice president for corporate affairs for Chiquita Brands mm-hmm. International Inc. From 1993 until December 2000, Mr. Hagen was chairman of the Portman for Congress campaign. Natalie Portman's ill-fated run for Congress, of course. Mr. Hagen served for two years on the White House staff as appointments secretary to President George H.W. Bush from 1991 to 1993. So he later worked for Trump and was one of the people who was apparently instrumental in setting up the meeting with Kim Jong-un. But he's basically just like a like deals He's a connector. Guy. He's a connector. He's, a, he's an operator, right? He's a Yeah, I think if guy. you're handling the quote-unquote appointments for yeah. HW. Yeah. Come on, man. Exactly. What are you doing? So the other guy All with them. off the books. And I cannot figure out for the life of me. I didn't I, – I'll admit I didn't do over much research on this guy because I got a little distracted. But the other guy with them is this guy Adam Hawk. Who Crazy is, name. Quote, a, Hagen and Hawk? Hagen and Hawk is a, quote, businessman a and nightclub bar? owner. Now, Adam Hawk's – Biggest claim to fame was he made a ton of headlines shortly after this Libya trip for breaking the nose of the Prince of Monaco in a neatpacking district nightclub. Interesting. He claims to have been, and I quote, I am quoting, defending the honor of supermodels. Amazing. Which the young Prince of Monaco was trying to get with. I believe that. He was, he basically like, he, there was like, he was chilling with like the owner of this nightclub and these three supermodels. Uh, or let's probably just models. 
at their uh, at their table or whatever, getting bottle service, etc. Prince of Monaco comes up with uh, like four other young – Prince of Monaco is like 25 at this point. He comes up with Paris Hilton's like Greek DJ ex-boyfriend uh-huh. and like a couple other guys like what, that. Oh, my God. What was the guy's fucking I name? I can't remember. I read, it, I read it when I was putting these notes together. Shit. How am I forgetting? Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed of my like girl credentials and I'm forgetting I will name. look uh, – Paris Hilton, Greek ex-boyfriend. Yeah, His name is Stavros Nyarkos. I knew that. Stavros. I was going to say Stavros, but then I was getting Stavros you know. Halkius. Yeah, I yeah. know. I think that it was. I don't think that was an official thing. Um, it, and uh, you know, the Prince of Monaco comes up and is like, "Let me sit at this table and talk to these beautiful women." And Adam Hawk, who's like forty-five, this kind of bigger guy, gets up and one punch breaks the Prince of Monaco's nose. Wow! So and they say chivalry is dead. This is heavily covered. There's, I gotta be honest, probably about twenty articles in the New York Post about this. Mm. Like clearly, Hawk had him on the fucking line every night because uh, they're very much pro Adam Hawk. But he is later banned from Monaco itself and not allowed to attend. Specifically, not allowed to attend Naomi Campbell's birthday bash at the Billionaire Club. I do feel like. As a businessman and nightclub owner, getting banned from Monaco is a pretty it's tough pretty one to sick. swallow. And he, it's, you know what? I will say this. Adam Hawk says, it's, I bear no no ill will. I get it. I'm going on to Ibiza. All my friends can go to Monaco. Naomi Campbell's yeah. uh, birthday party at the Billionaires Club in Monaco. I'm going to Ibiza. No racetrack Ibiza. in Ibiza, though. No, but it's tough. It's tough. Is there probably is a racetrack there? No? Not, not F1. Not F1. F2, maybe. <laughs> or just regular F. So God knows what the fuck this Libya trip was like. I mean, I don't really understand why Adam Hawk was there. I gotta to begin say, with. anyone who's taken a trip to Libya a month after Gaddafi's a month murdered, after Gaddafi is killed, like, mm, what are you doing? Where are you staying? So I was like, oh, what the fuck is the Independent Libya Foundation? So I was looking into it, and Independent Libya Foundation was subject to a report by the New Libya Report, which is itself is itself a website, which says that all the numbers and associated addresses to the Independent Libya Foundation are completely fake. Their the well, addresses don't exist. The phone numbers were never connected. I understand it's, that. It was never registered as any kind of organization. Like the so foundation does, doesn't exist. Does not exist. Does not exist. It never this foundation did. foundation does not exist. ICTIT claims at this point to be developing a plan with future Brookings president and fa- former commander of NATO forces in Afghanistan, General John Allen. Jesus Christ. Com- well, this is what ICTIT claims. Coming up with a plan... Uh, to fix the country's brewing new civil war. Yeah, so at this point, right, <laughs> what's happening in Libya is outright, like, just total chaos. Yeah, yeah, like, Gaddafi's dead, and there's these sort of, like, competing institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. It's, it's, it's like the, the, the yeah. The, On that Benghazi episode. There's like, the, there's, like, the General National Congress, and then there's the... Uh, National Trans- Transitional Council. It's like these, like sort of attempts to start a government. Yeah, but they're like feuding and eventually an a dual power war. situation. Dual power, not a good situation. dual power situation. <laughs> um, you know, Igtet at the same time is like uh, this country is going to be ripe for investment. So, basic Igtet. Uh, at this time sets up the U.S.-Libya Chamber of Commerce, which is, I guess, a subsidiary of the regular U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Which is crazy, but also understandable that they would be involved. Get Their yeah. ass is 100% wet in Libya. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Chamber of Con- Commerce is just like, it's a, car- it's a cartel, you know. It's, yeah. it's, so, but the, the, the U.S.-Libya Chamber of Commerce is Weird. So it was founded along with a similar Swiss organization. I think it's the Swiss Libyan Chamber of Commerce uh, with Bayset Igtet, uh, Sarah Bronfman, and a man named Richard Griffiths, who claims in his own CV to have worked for Bloomberg, like Mayor Bloomberg, in the Taxi Cab Limo Commission, which screams mafia to me. Yes. He worked at uh, a publicly traded company called Skakes Tactical, which <laughs> apparently is <laughs> like – uh, provided military equipment to the U.S. Okay. Uh, although I can't really find any information on them, but again, I didn't look very hard on this one. Uh, and he claims himself to have worked with the CIA and FBI, and he speaks Afrikaans. Now, I do want everyone <laughs> <laughs> listening to this to keep in mind that the place where he claims this is in the bio section of his Facebook page in some of the most strangely formatted like CV I've ever seen. Like this wasn't from LinkedIn. This is like an old screen grab from like his Facebook bio. And that does make one doubt perhaps the professionalism of this individual, but he certainly is connected to Igtit and Brofman in some way. So the same year, 2011, Bazet 
and Sarah Bronfman start an oil and gas exploration company for Libya called Athol. Now, Athol does not pan out, but there is currently an Athol in Libya that sells what appears to be cheap cosmetic and uh, medical equipment. Mm. Uh, and it seems like they, they also had another company called that in France at one point. But meanwhile, while all this is going on, according to basically the only mainstream article covering this stuff, which is in BuzzFeed, uh, Joseph Hagen was actually looking to get his paws on Gaddafi's hidden money. Gaddafi's gold. Gaddafi's gold. So maybe some people don't remember, but after Gaddafi died, there was this huge race by all of the craziest motherfuckers in the world to basically get their hands on Gaddafi's like secreted away billions, rumored to be as high as 400 billion, which I think is bullshit. Uh, you know who loved money and wanted money? Keith Raniere. Absolutely. You know, so, he needed more money to bet on Oats futures. Well, something that occurs to me also is a huge part of this money was rumored to be in South Africa. And, of course, they've got, they're working closely with this random fucking dude, Richard Griffiths, mm. who speaks Afrikaans. And so at this point, Bezit Iktet basically claims to be an emissary from the National Transitional Council, which is kind of like the, the main government in waiting in Libya, mm. or like the newly forming, very dysfunctional government. And... Uh, and my uh, my theory here is that like Rainier was like, like like the National Transitional Council was laying claim to legally they the Gaddafi's money was theirs because they're the government, right? And so, with Bayzet Iktet working for with around them, like I think that that was his way of like trying to have some mm. legitimacy to his claims to stealing Gaddafi's gold, like llama style, llama style, llama style, exactly. So Bayzet Iktet and Sarah Bronfman funded John Hagen's search. He says, everyone says they, he came up empty, but if he didn't come up empty, would they tell us? I don't think so. But Hagen did not come up empty with an introduction to Libya's militia scene. Oof. So a year after Benghazi, and this is now 2013, Iktet meets with Abu Qatala, who the U.S. later arrested as the perpetrator of the Benghazi attacks that killed Ambassador Chris Stevens. Now, I don't know if he met with Abu Qatala on Keith Rainier's behalf, but he definitely it very much seems that at this point, 2013 to about 2017, Iktet is trying to gain some kind of legitimacy between like militias in Libya because that's who holds a lot of the power. Is like these sort and of like, probably in his brain, the key to Gaddafi's gold. Exactly. Now, I want listeners to keep in mind here. Basit Iktet is married to Sarah Bronfman, who is a Jewish woman who is – all of her money comes from a liquor fortune. Yeah. And I just wanted like for – Her dad is the president of the World Jewish Congress. Yes. And so <laughs> this is just like – I don't know exactly what Bayzet thought his chances of political success were going to be, but one could imagine this. You mean in terms of trying to get buddy-buddy with Abu Qatala? Abu Qatala, yeah. Well, because at this point in America – so he's meeting with Abu Qatala in Benghazi, but in America – he hires this guy. Do you remember Joe Lieberman? Uh, sure, yeah, of course. He rings a bell. Connecticut congressman. He hires Joe Lieberman's consulting lobbying firm at 50 fucking racks a month to make inroads in Washington. So it's later reported. So that's also Bromfin money. That's Bromf. Oh, it's all Bromfin money. Like yes. this is the this is the thing that we got to keep in mind. Iktet like isn't him independently wealthy. No, and also Nexium is operating on Bromfin money. Next, and and this is like during like peak neck. I mean, this is 2013, but like, yeah, this is like peak Nexium time. Like, yeah, this is the money is fucking flowing. It's like I mean they're cult whatever we all know it, but like it's it's yeah. Like this is all – like Bronfman is bankrolling all of this. And so this is what I mean earlier when it's like hard to separate this operation from the like n general Keith Rainier Nexium operation, mm. influence operations that he was doing. So it's later reported in foreign policy – in a foreign policy article about Bezit Iktet's political aspirations, which makes no mention of Nexium, that Iktet is personal friends with John Kerry and John McCain, the twin Johns of the – uh, uh, D.C., unfortunately, until one of them was, was killed um, by Donald Trump. That would be John McCain. So Iktet bides his time. 
he's not giving up. And he sees the dysfunction rife within the warring governments of Libya. And th- at this point, 2014, there is a civil war that is erupting. Like major civil war. Major, major civil war with a lot of major foreign powers getting involved in it. Yeah, proxy, proxy. classic style. But yeah, pro- and, and, and irreg- let's say maybe some uh, PMCs as well. Yeah. Uh, so he makes further inroads among the Muslim Brotherhood leadership of not only of Libya, but of Tunisia and Egypt and various fringe Islamist groups. So one article I found says that he receives a pledge from the Al Bunyan, which come on, Al Bunyan Al Marsus Shahid Nuri Frewan Brigade, a former rebel, rebel group that I can only find referenced in an article that reports them pledging their support for IGTIT. Okay, so fake. So probably fake. Where Apparently they're mean? a former member of Libyan Dawn, but I, th- there's literally the, – there's three yeah. Google results that come up if you Google them. And one of them is – all three of them are this article. So he releases a 10-point plan for Libya that says basically nothing except that they need to create fortified areas. Oh, we need to fortify our – reminds me of Hillary Clinton's famous. It is – no, Liz. It is so – I've read every single one of Bezit Iktet's uh, like policy documents for Libya. They are so Clinton-esque. In- well, what was the Clinton famous like plan for ISIS? Tweet. It was like we need to fortify our response to ISIS. We need to defeat ISIS. And it then- was It was a great plan. All right, Hillary Clinton tweeted in – oh, my God. It's in like – it's each individual uh, panels. It's kind of like an Instagram thing. Uh, this is from March 23rd, 2016. Hillary has a three-part plan to defeat ISIS in the Middle East, around the world, and here at home. Uh, at home? Number one, Could take out – ISIS at home. Well, number one, take out ISIS's stronghold in Iraq and Syria. Number two, dismantle the global terror network. Number three, harden our defenses ah, at home and prevent attacks. Harden our defenses. All those ISIS attacks that went down in America. Mm. Um, so he's clearly, you know, drinking from the same uh, chalice as Clinton here. The info, info chalice. So in 2014, Igtit decides, I am running for prime minister of Libya. Why not? He's described by Libya Herald as one of the, quote, Top 17 candidates in the race. (laughs) Oh, shit. Uh, And he eventually drops out because, and I cannot stress this enough, he does not live in Libya. Well, that was fine for Eric Adams. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Because what is Albany, New York, but sort of the the New Jersey to Libya's New York City? That's what I'm saying. I've always said that. Uh, he eventually drops out because, again, he does not live in Libya. But he says, no, don't worry. I'm not running for prime minister. But when we have a new constitution that has a strong presidency, I'm going to run for president. Spoiler alert, this does not happen. But the years pass, and it's now 2017, and Igtit has not given up hope. As Libya's civil war grows ever bloodier, and as the noose tightens around Nexium, Igtit and Bronfman play one final card. They're going to do an Arab Spring in Tripoli. Which is sort of crazy to try, like, we're going to do another one. We're going to try and do another one. It's, you can so obviously see from the plan that they laid out that, that I, which is claimed that, like, the dude, what is that guy who always report, like, the Frank report guy? Yeah. That guy claims that Keith Ranieri came up with a plan, but I, I mean. Well, the Frank, I, say what you will. He, I love the Frank report. Yeah, he was talking about, the, he had all the Nexium stuff for years. No, I mean, he worked, well, it's because I think he got, he got burned on some real estate yeah. deal with Sarah Bronfman and Nexium in L.A. Yeah, and, and he, he just went all that fucking stuff. ham. Yeah. Which? I was going to pay your guys. You got to pay your guys. You got to pay your guys. You're going you to end up with a, grudge, a, a guy with a grudge and a blog. He And I will say, one of his, his – he wrote an article about the reported – well, I'll get to that at the end. But he wrote an article about Igtet and, uh, and Bronfman's love life that is replete with some of the most colorful language I've ever read on the internet. It's yeah. incredible. So the plan is this. Iktid announces on Facebook that he's going to have a huge demonstration at Martyr Square in Tripoli and what he is calling the 25th of September movement. Mm. Now he's saying this is going to happen obviously on the 25th of September. He names it that movement like uh, before it even happens. Now this is hyped up. It's like very artic- uh, obvious that like they pl- try to place these articles in local press. There's press releases from Bezit Iktid. There's armed groups that are rumored to be supporting them. And then on the 25th of September, Bezit Igtet flies in that day from out of the country. 
The Libya Observer meets him for an interview where he effusively praises the airport staff for being nice to him, even though his passport wasn't in the system because he's been to Libya like twice since moving from there as a child. And then he goes to a demonstration where less than a thousand people come and go over the course of the day. And there are different reports of how many counter protesters are. I've seen from like a couple dozen to 700, but there are multiple people there like wanting him to leave the country immediately. Which he obliges by leaving that same day without ever giving a speech and the most press that he does is the Libya Observer English inter language interview on YouTube for six minutes about the airport staff. But his security chief has a rather more difficult night. Liz, could you read this article from – I believe this is the Libya uh, Herald – it's reported that one of Bezit Iktet's security advisors died in a shooting incident just hours after he met with Iktet yesterday. The man, named as Bashir Garira, is said to have died after being shot outside his home this morning in Souk al Juma. Yesterday, he was photographed as part of the welcoming group for Iktet on his arrival at Matiga Airport from Tunis. The family says that he was killed while he was cleaning his gun. Okay. Classic. There are other claims, however, that he was followed home and shot, although no reasons have been given as to why anyone would want to kill him. Now, well, we've got a couple reasons. We've got a couple reasons. Iktit makes no statement on the uh, assassination of a security chief, but he does release a video pledging to form a new Libyan government by that October. Uh, and then he disappears. Yeah. So he and Sarah Bronfman, you know, Nexium, as we all know, blows up. Everyone gets in trouble. He and Sarah Bronfman move to France, invest and fail at their investment in a hotel, start and fail at a Keith Rainier inspired school, and now, according to the Frank Report, have broken Really? Up. Yeah. Uh, so according to the Frank Report, uh, Sarah Bronfman has taken up with a young Portuguese man and uh, – in attempting to reason after, as to why this happened, this is what the Frank Report reports. Perhaps, she recalled, after two children and a decade of facet, replete with vicissitudes of reputational fortune, the amours of the past when she experienced a succession of satisfying, swarthy Latino lovers down Mexico way, both before, after, and in between her delight with a certain American short it is true, square-footed with a case of strabismus, but whose athleticism, he was a judo master and volleyball king, was surpassed only by his ethics and the fact that he was officially declared, at least in Australia, to be the smartest man in the world and later confirmed by a study the man, who alone was smart enough to do such a study, himself wrote and published that confirmed that his problem-solving rarity was one in 425 million. And, as to past moors to set the record straight, lest one think infidelity is habit, the Hispanic contingent was decidedly, although shortly, perhaps minutes, after that petite but well-proportioned man she married in a fever and divorced in a cold sweat, a surprisingly athletic man, as wiry and nimble on a horse as he was climbing in and out of her bed, had fully ridden away. And now, after all this, and a wearying decade of Bassett comes, young Adonis. Woo! What a hell of a writer this Frank Report guy is. It's funny because I like... I think what a read by, what a, what by a, this yeah, podcaster. Respect. Thank you. Thank the first you for time that, I've Liz. seen that text. This on is, first read. This first is, take. This is, uh, this is a Frank Report describing her affair with two Mexican men uh, yeah, that was and great. Keith Raniere, as if, if you couldn't tell by the mm -hmm. long description there. And, and drop then, vicissitudes in the second clause. You know it's <laughs> it's going to be a banger. Bezit Igtet, who, by the way, she did buy, bear a child with. Hmm. Uh, and as now, according to Frank Report, she has taken up with, uh, he uses this word many times, uh, a young Portuguese Adonis. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is, I yeah, a young I could say an Adonis. You know what's crazy is that reading about some of the fallout for Sarah after the Nexium stuff is that she actually stands to make money off the whole thing. How so? So like she was one of the co owners of the Albany property. And oh, yeah. that that goes into sale by, you know, the you know, after it was, you know, taken over by 
by the U.S. Attorney's Office. That goes into sale. And so she ends up making money off of that property, no I, I believe. Wow, Which that's is fucking incredible. crazy. Yeah, because it's probably worth a or lot more. Or people are speculating about that at least. Wow. I mean, yeah, she is. She seems to have like, uh, you know, there's a, her website's down now, but sarahbronfman.co.uk did feature, I have no involvement with Nexium on it as of like a 2021. Well, you know what they say about, exactly. you know. Thou doth protest too much. Mm, I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, she, uh, she. I will say, if this is truly the end for Bezit Igtet and Sarah Bronfman Igtet, then I say, love is beautiful, but it can be a fleeting thing. You know, Gaddafi loved his country. He loved Libya. He loved the Libyan people. He loved beautiful women as 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 almost as much as I do. But more importantly than that, he loved the United States of Africa, mm-hmm. and he was killed because of that. Mm. And it seems that you need to just, you can only really, you can, you, there's, there's a certain amount of love that we're able to give in this world. And Bezit's love torn between his love of his country, Libya, his love of his wife and, and her organization, she and he belong no, to, his, next to him. His country. A country. A country that he lived in at one point called Libya, briefly during childhood and occasionally visited in the search for the deposed leader's gold. Um... You know, I think that if he had just worked on his marriage instead of worked on um, Abu Qatala, then I think things could have turned out different. Also, just as a final note, if you have any clues about Gaddafi's gold, as always, hit the DMs. I want to know where the gold's at. Give me the gold. I want the gold. I will say all of the terrible stuff in this story aside— and that's a lot. Just let for one second. I do love an adventure with a ragtag group trying to track down. I love a group of people trying to find a gold. A deposed man's gold. I, I got to tell you, a lot of people who've tried to find gold in the past have been not so great people. You a know? lot of times it was Polish people trying to do it. And that's you're not sending your best. Not se- Well, th- not really a best to send from, really. But whole country kind of the back bench. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be polite. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm trying to I, be on team right I, there. Okay, yeah. I mean, I would say work on the whole light bulb screwing thing first, but maybe gold can provide certain light. If it I think the three the of us could find gold. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I have a. I would say a terminal case of gold fever. I and love gold. I'm really good at reading directions, mm. and I have a really good sense of direction. Yeah, me too. Me too. And so I think that that combined with a treasure map could bring us riches. Power, fame, fortune, etc. Like, I think if we had tried to find the treasures of Sierra Madre, it wouldn't have gone down like that. The problem is, is that it's really about the process, where I think that we would all learn a lot in the process of trying to track down the gold. But if we were to find the gold, we would obviously, one, be cursed, mm. and all three die in very mysterious and tantalizing I ways, which, that. good for the legacy, bad for the podcast. Bad for the show, really bad for the show. Well, with that being said, you know, the show might end, but we'll possibly get gold, maybe die. Uh, if you do know where the gold is, please let us know. And that is the story of Nexium in Libya. My name is Brace Belden. I'm Liz. We are, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky, and this has been Drone On. We'll see you next time, which sounds like Nexium when I say it real fast. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>